and I'll also turn on the captions. And if you uh, prefer to have those on or off, you can just toggle them off or on at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will uh, introduce our speaker in a moment, but I just want to take a moment to say that this is our last seminar, uh, last uh, brown bag seminar for the semester. We have one more event coming up next Monday, December 6th. This is going to be a specific AIMS clinic where we will invite a researcher to share the specific aims from a research proposal that she has in development. So Dr. Jennifer Augustine from the University of South Carolina has generously agreed to share her research in progress with us. Um, and several faculty members will provide feedback on, the specific, on her specific aims after a brief presentation that she makes. We'll share those aims ahead of time. We'll send out an announcement about that event a bit later uh, today or tomorrow. And we're just gonna ask you to register or to follow up with us over email to let us know that you'd like to attend. And then we'll share the aims with you. Uh, we just prefer to do it rather that way rather than to sort of broadcast them uh, prior to this event. But in any case, this is a fir the first event that we're doing in this series and we encourage you to attend. It's a great way to get a sense of how research proposals and research programs development. So I hope we'll uh, develop, so I hope we'll see you here again next week at, uh, at noon Eastern for that event. Uh, for today's event, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Melanie Wasserman, who will be known to many of you as a former postdoc here at PSC. When she begins her presentation, I'll note that she's uh, taking questions throughout, so you can unmute yourself and speak up. We'll give about 45 to 50 minutes in total for her presentation and discussion. So we'll aim to wrap up around five minutes to one so that we have about 15 minutes remaining for a professional development conversation with our trainees as we've done in prior weeks. So um, until then, uh, again, uh, for those just coming in, you're welcome to ask questions as we go. So just to give you a bit of background about Dr. Wasserman, she is Assistant Professor of Economics at the UCLA School, Anderson School of Management. She received her PhD in economics from MIT in 2016, and she was here as a postdoctoral fellow until 2017 when she joined the faculty at the Anderson School. Her research investigates the mechanisms underlying gender differences in labor market, occupational, and educational outcomes. The background to her research is in, in, is, uh, in women's labor force participate, rising labor force participation during the last half century, and the more recent slowdown in the convergence between men's and women's economic outcomes. A key question in her work is whether a job's non-monetary attributes influence an individual's choice of job or career. Her published work has appeared in American Economic Journal, Applied Economics, and Review of Economics and Statistics. Today, she'll present current research on the gender gap in summer work interruptions. So please join, join me in welcome, welcoming Professor Wasserman to PSC, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so thanks so much for that really wonderful introduction. Um, I am delighted to be back here virtually um, presenting. Um, I had a really great experience as a postdoc, um, and so I'm excited to share with you um, some more recent work entitled uh, The Gender Gap in Summer Work Interruptions. Uh, this is joint work um, with Brendan Price at the Federal Reserve Board. I just want to highlight the, his uh, standard disclaimer um, from the Fed. Okay, so I'll start off with um, a figure that will be familiar to, um, can you all see my slides okay? Okay, great. Um, so I'll start off with a figure that will be familiar to many of you. So in recent months, there's been a lot of discussion about the substantial drop in labor force participation due to the pandemic, which has been particularly pronounced among women. So in this figure, we plot prime age labor force participation from 2015 to approximately the present day, and we see the steep drop in April 2020 at the onset of the pandemic. The drop is notably steeper among women, and there's also a weaker recovery among women. So much of the discussion regarding the steeper drop and the weaker recovery among women has surrounded the role of school closures. And in particular, how school closures have disproportionately affected female labor supply, in particular, maternal labor supply, um, with uh, women um, on average taking on kind of a disproportionate share of childcare duties. And so school closures disproportionately affect affecting their capacity to work. So while pandemic-induced school closures 
are, I would say, unprecedented in their scale, in their duration, in their unpredictability. We want to highlight a, I would say, more uh, frequent phenomenon, oops, sorry, which is annual school closures for summer break. Here, we have the same plot, but now what we've done is we've highlighted in gray the summer months of every year, that is June, July, and August. And what we observe is that every summer, there is a sharp drop in female labor force participation, even while male labor force participation remains stable. And so this paper is going to provide the first examination of gender differences in some summer work and highlight the prominent role of school closures in generating these uh, summer declines in female work in particular. So we're going to start off by documenting summer declines in female labor force activity among a number of margins. So first we'll show that women's employment to population rate or EPOP declines every summer by about 1.1 percentage points. This 1.1 percentage point decline is economically meaningful. It represents about a third of the decline in prime age female employment during the Great Recession. In contrast, men's EPOP, employment to population rate, rises slightly over the summer months. Second, we document that the summer drop in female employment is mostly driven by elevated outflows. That is, women's transition from employment to non-employment rather than depressed inflows. Okay, so this suggests that women are transitioning out of employment during the summer months relative to the rest of the year. And then third, what we highlight is that these changes in employment on the extensive margin are reinforced by changes on the intensive margin as well. So summer hours contract more for women than for men. And in fact, women's summer hours in aggregate plunge by about 11% uh, on an annual basis. So after we go through and document these kind of three new empirical facts about uh, gender gaps and summer work interruptions, we'll go through and, sorry, there's a little bit of a lag on my end with, uh, we'll go through and we will document the central role of school closures in generating these gaps. So the first thing that we do is we document the decline in female employment tracks a school calendar. So we split geographic variation across the US in the precise timing of when schools get out for the summer. And we show that female employment tends to tightly align with the timing of schools, of when schools go, get out in uh, that particular locality. So this suggests to us that school closures are indeed kind of the root of these summer employment declines among women. Next, we recognize that school closures represent a disruption to the childcare that's implicitly provided by schools, so publicly provided daytime childcare. And if this is the case, then we would expect that certain subgroups of women would be more affected by school closures and their employment decisions relative to other groups of women. And in particular, what we find is that the decline in summer employment is concentrated among mothers, especially mothers of young school-age children, so ages 6 to 12. We also document that um, among these individuals, among mothers of school-aged children, they report that while not in the labor force, they are taking care of their family and children. So they actually say that my reason for not being in the labor force during the summer months is to take care of my family. Using the American Time Use Survey, we're able to document that there is a uptick in the uh, total amount of childcare that's provided by mothers of school-aged children during the summer months. So this to us suggests a role for school closures, disrupting childcare, these increased childcare demands, um, uh, leading women to change their employment decisions, potentially transition from employment to non-employment um, in order to take care of their children during the summer months. We also acknowledge that school closures represent a contraction in the employment in the education sector in which women are disproportionately represented. And so we examine the role for sectoral and occupational sorting in explaining the gender gap in summer work interruptions. So what we find is that um, women's greater propensity to work in the education sector as well as other sectors that afford summer flexibility explain about half of this gender gap in summer work interruptions. However, there's also a strong within sector and within job component. 
So even within granular jobs in the education sector, women are more likely to exit employment relative to men during the summer months. So this kind of constellation of evidence suggests to us that school closures are, I would say, playing a prominent role in generating the gender gap in summer work interruptions. Finally, we document some ramifications for these uh, gender gaps in summer work interruptions for the gender gap in earnings. So it's a little bit hard for us to gain traction on the, I would say, precise role of summer work interruptions in generating gender gaps in earnings because there is this kind of anticipatory sorting components of sorting into various sectors and occupations, as well as um, within a sector and occupation, the um, propensity of women to um, exit employment during the summer months relative to men. However, what we are able to show is that women within an occupation are more likely to sort into jobs with lower work demands over the summer. So we can say within an occupation, women are more likely to be working in the education sector relative to the non-education sector and annual earnings in these jobs that afford more summer flexibility are lower than in their jobs that do not afford as much summer flexibility. And not only are annual earnings lower, but hourly earnings are lower. And to us, this suggests that um, women could be trading off compensation in order to gain access to jobs, gain access to a work setting that affords them greater summer flexibility. Um, and so I just wanna uh, make sure that everyone knows that you um, can feel free to interject throughout if you have questions. And so please um, just feel free to unmute yourself in the, in the event that you have questions. Okay, so next, um, what I'll do is I will. Hey, Melanie, uh, sorry, uh, I want to yes. jump in. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick things off with a question. So, uh, you know, I, I really like this framing for the last point about, you know, it's not just the implications during the summer, but, you know, the what's happening during the non summer months is impacted by these school closures because of how women are sorting into these, these uh, specific occupations that'll, that provide the ability to um, drop out of the labor force during the summer. You, know, you framed it as um, potentially like a compensating differential that they're paid less because um, they have the flexibility, but it could also maybe not be a compensating differential that um, you know they're just paid less because there are these gaps in experience and so their compensation is suppressed and so this is this isn't necessarily something that's welfare improving or welfare neutral. Um, for, for them to be in these positions, but because of the disproportionate role that women have to take on in childcare over the summers, this is creating, um, you know, just a, a gender gap in earnings and welfare overall. Yeah, so I think that's a really great point. So um, I guess to kind of partially answer it, maybe on like a technicality. So what we find is that women are more likely to sort into jobs that, you know, have, you um, greater summer flexibility or lower work demands over the summer. So, you know, within a given occupation, they're more likely to sort into like the education sector version of that job, you know, to be like a secretary in educational services versus outside of educational services. And then the fact that annual earnings are lower in these jobs, we actually use male earnings for that. And so that's trying to kind of abstract away from the perhaps like suppressed human capital accumulation or the direct effect of um, work interruptions on, um, on earnings. I don't know if that if that helps, but that was sort of the way that we were thinking about thinking about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's totally right, and those are those are really helpful exercises. It just seems like first, even within kind of occupations or industries, like women might not be able to get beyond entry level work because of this kind of, and it's not by choice. Yeah. So so uh, we are um, so I agree that that is um, a totally reasonable hypothesis. Unfortunately, we're not able to like directly get at that. And so we've you know, we've uh, struggled a bit in this paper to try to come up with like a summary exercise for the ramifications for the gender gap in earnings, just because there is there is so much going on. There is, you know, I would say like the direct effect of, you know, actually working fewer hours and fewer weeks per year. And then there are all of these sort of indirect effects through like reduced human capital accumulation, occupational sorting, um, work interruptions, impeding you know, job progression. Um, and so uh, we acknowledge that all of these potentially exist, but in practice, it's been, it's been a bit difficult for us to get at them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I just wanna briefly touch on the related literature. Um, so we see these papers contributing to three literatures. 
So the first is um, gender dif differences in labor supply, both on the extensive and intensive margin. So there's a large literature documenting that gender differences in the continuity level and timing of work um, contribute to the gender pay gap. Um, uh, there's also, I would say, another branch of this literature that um, looks at the direct effects of motherhood on various dimensions of um, labor supply, as well as on wages and earnings. So the motherhood penalty has been, I would say, a very active area of research. And indeed, you know, in this paper, we find that these um, summer declines are most pronounced among mothers. And so this is, you know, tightly linked to um, uh, the presence of children in the home. And um, then finally, there's a literature on the role of childcare and school availability, um, which you know, generally finds that when there are expansions in school availability, this has positive effects on female labor supply. Um, there are a few, I would say, more recent papers that look in particular about kind of uh, um, small perturbations in school schedules, especially um, like in France, moving from a Monday through Friday schedule instead of a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday schedule, um, and shows that there are also gains to female labor supply and occupational choice, occupational sorting um, from having more kind of continuity in school schedules. Um, and then finally, there is a little bit of work um, looking at year round versus, um, I would say, more traditional school schedules. It actually finds kind of negative ramifications of year round schedules um, for female labor supply. And so we, we think, um, sorry, there's a lag um, on my end. Let me go back. Ah, so we see our paper as contributing to this, I would say, voluminous literature on gender differences in labor supply by, um, I would say, one, you know, documenting these kind of new empirical facts regarding gender differences in summer work interruptions, and I would say more generally analyzing an understudied temporal dimension of female labor force activity. So many temporal dimensions of female labor force activity have been analyzed um, in terms of, you know, the hours, that are worked per week, which hours are worked per week, the weeks that are worked per week throughout the year. Um, and this seasonality dimension um, for one reason or another has been somewhat overlooked. We also see our paper as contributing to a um, more uh, macro literature on the real world consequences of seasonal phenomena. And so there are various seasonal regularities in the macro economy, for instance, in the housing market, um, in the ramifications of monetary policy throughout the year. Um, there's also a smaller literature um, on seasonal work interruptions, including a paper by my co-author, Brendan, that looks at the ramifications of seasonal work interruptions for household budgets and household consumption. And so we see our paper as contributing to um, the real world consequences of seasonal phenomena. And then finally, um, as I motivated you know, with the initial plots, this paper also contributes to the gendered impacts of COVID. Um, so the pandemic has you know, uh, caused disproportionate impacts on female labor supply, labor force participation, um, I would say through um, various channels. So one, you know, through um, affecting sectors in which women tend to be highly represented. The second, through these school closures. And, you know, we see our paper as, um, you know, being related to this literature through its, you know, examination of the prominent role of school closures in generating these um, summer declines in female employment. Um, the one thing that we'll say is that, you know, once the pandemic is over, it will end at some point, um, we are going to revert to our usual schooling patterns. So these usual kind of traditional school year patterns. And so the phenomenon that we document in this paper, even when schools are up and running again, you know, fully um, predictable, fully functional, um, the patterns that we document in our paper, we think are kind of here to stay. So here's a roadmap for the rest of the presentation. Next, I'll jump into um, data and the specification. So um, we use the current population survey uh, throughout this paper. It's um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it. It's a monthly labor, uh, monthly labor force survey, in particular, a household survey. We use the pre-pandemic, the 30 years pre-pandemic, so 1989 to 2019, and we focus on prime age individuals, um, ages 25 to 49. Um, we use various measures of work activity during the reference week. So the reference week tends to be the second week of the month. So the week that usually um, straddles the 12th of the month. Um, and we'll use um, work activity on the extensive margins. So that is whether an individual is in the labor force 
for the, the individuals employed, and also um, measures of work activity on the intensive margin. So that is hours worked and whether they are absent from work, so employed but absent from work. Um, we are going to exploit both the cross-sectional and longitudinal dimensions of the CPS. So with cross-sectional dimension, it would be um, like the employment to population rate, um, so employment, labor force participation rate. Uh, for the longitudinal dimension, um, what we do is we link individuals um, from month to month. There is a longitudinal component of the CPS. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the survey structure, individuals are surveyed for four consecutive months, then they are out of the sample for eight months, and then they are back in the CPS sample for another four months. And so we're able to longitudinally link individuals to see their month to month flow. So their transitions, for example, from employment to non-employment or from non-employment to employment. Um, and later on, I just wanna highlight that we'll also be using the American Time Use Survey to look at um, seasonal changes in time use. So our main specification will be um, a time series specification. So we'll have an outcome variable. So it could be uh, the, un, uh, sorry, the employment to population rate, for example, um, in a given month and year. And we will regress it on a series of month fixed effects where we will omit May um, as our reference category. And um, then these month fixed effects will um, indeed be our coefficients of interest. So we're interested in seasonality and work activity. And so um, these month fixed effects will tell us, for example, the change in the employment population rate in June relative to May. Um, we also have other controls in our regression. So we have in order to capture um, or order to control for um, say, uh, more like longer term secular trends, we use a linear spline as well as a kind of other uh, business cycle fluctuations. Um, we have linear, uh, linear spline with knots at business cycle peaks and troughs, um, in particular at turning points in the unemployment rate um, as um, documented in um, these papers that are highlighted on the slide. Um, in addition, we um, control for the gap um, so the number of weeks that are elapsed between reference weeks in the CPS. So as I mentioned, the reference week is generally the second week of the month, but sometimes it can be um, a little bit later in the month if uh, the survey is disrupted due to holidays, for example. And so um, because flows will be kind of mechanically related to the weeks elapsed, we want to account for this in our um, specification. Um, a little bit more on this. So um, our main specification is going to be a group level specification. So where we um, aggregate up, um, to the month year level using CPS sampling weights. And we'll um, estimate this separately for um, each group. So mostly for men and for women, but then in certain specifications, we'll also see um, uh, that we'll uh, estimate it for certain subgroups of women, such as uh, mothers and non-mothers. Um, to account for um, heteroscedasticity and serial correlation error structure, we use new US standard errors. There is a procedure that um, determines an optimal bandwidth for the number of lags in the error structure. And we use this and we um, generally use 27 lags throughout. Okay. Um, so I see that there is a little bit of activity on the chat. And unfortunately, it's a little hard for me to um, uh, monitor the chat throughout. And so if you do have questions, I encourage you to um, gently interject throughout. All right, so now uh, I will get into the three kind of main facts regarding summer declines in female work activity. Okay. So first, I'll just walk you through how to um, read these figures. So these figures are going to pop up throughout the presentation. And um, here what we have on the x-axis are um, the months throughout the year. We, um, since we normalize everything relative to May, so May is the first month, we highlight in gray the summer months that are going to be the um, subject of our empirical inquiry. And um, the way that you should, so what we, we've done here is we've plotted those beta Ms, those month fixed effects. And the way that you should interpret this, we're starting off by looking at the employment to population rate. And so the interpretation here is um, you know, the uh, change in the employment to population rate relative to May. So all of these fixed effects are relative to May. So our first fact is that female employment declines by 
1.1 percentage point each summer. Okay, so we see that the decline starts in June, bottoms out in July. That's where the May to July change is 1.1 percentage points. Okay, and then um, it continues throughout August and then rebounds in September. Okay. As I mentioned in the introduction, this decline of 1.1 percentage points we think is economically meaningful. So it represents a third of the decline in the female employment population rate during the Great Recession. Now I'm going to introduce a few other measures of labor force activity. So first, the non-participation rate. So this is the rate of individuals um, who are not in the labor force. So, uh, and then the unemployment rate. So here, what we observe is that over the summer months, there's a rise in the non-participation rate and also a rise in the unemployment rate. So both unemployment and non-participation are rising unemployment and rising non-participation are contributing to the declines in female employment. In contrast, what we see for men is quite distinct over the summer months. So for men, there's basically nothing going on over the summer. If anything, there's a slight rise in the employment to population rate, really nothing going on with changes in labor force participation rates and very little going on in employment. What you'll notice for men is that all the action is occurring during winter, okay? So winter is not exactly the um, focus of our paper, but I, since it's so pronounced during winter, I wanna note that um, there are, I would say, well-known seasonal phenomena, um, especially in labor demand over winter months. So there's the contraction of heavily male-dominated sectors, such as construction and agriculture. And so the steep drop in employment during the winter months for men is likely due to the sectoral sorting of men into these sectors that tend to contract during the winter months. So the summer decline in female employment is going to be some combination of depressed inflows into employment and elevated outflows from employment. So the next thing I wanna do is actually examine whether it's the uh, decline in employment is due to the fact that women are disproportionately exiting employment during the summer months or they're less likely to enter employment during the summer months. So we'll estimate um, specifications using net inflows uh, sorry, net flows, including inflows and outflows as the dependent variable. We'll use a longitudinal component of the CPS for this. And then um, this is kind of a technical issue. So we're going to use raked weights, which are these customized weights provided by IPMS to align stocks and flows. So here, um, here I know that uh, this is actually not normalized relative to uh, May. And so these are the month over month changes in the employment to population rate and how we decompose this into inflows and outflows. So what we see is that month over month in terms of the change in employment during the summer months is primarily due to elevated inflows. So here we've reversed the sign of uh, sorry, sorry, it's primarily due to elevated outflows. Here we've reversed the sign of outflows to make sure that it aligns with the sign of the change in employment. And so what we see is that this drop in employment during the summer months for women is primarily due to women transitioning out of employment relative to the rest of the year, rather than women uh, being less likely to transition into employment. Again, for men, what we see is that there's really not much going on during the summer months and most of the action is occurring during the winter months. Okay. Melanie, can you yes. go back to the last slide? So yeah, yeah. it would be, so as you were kind of doing this presentation, I was thinking, you know, um, who, who, what, who are the mothers who are on the margin of making this change over the summer? Um, and I would imagine it's somewhere between, um, I don't know, let me, let me take a step back. I'm trying to avoid putting my foot in my mouth. You know, so I was, I was thinking for very low income mothers, let's say single mothers, dropping out of the labor force might not be an option. But then at the same time, it could be that if you don't have any other child care responsibilities, it might be hard to maintain your employment status as well as caring for your kids. So the point of my question was, could you decompose the outflows to understand whether these are voluntary outflows for like, you know, um, maybe more middle-income families where 
they don't need work necessarily during the summer? Or could it be amongst lower income families where people, are, women are getting fired from their jobs because, you know, either they um, aren't able to maintain their regular schedule or for whatever reason they're being forced out? Yeah, so I think that's a, um, I think that's a really interesting point. So I think um, a couple of thoughts. So first, we do provide some additional um, uh, we uh, analyzed the female drop in employment during the summer months by um, various um, demographic characteristics, including by um, marital status and by child status. And so we see, you know, even within um, unmarried women, women with kids um, tend to experience steeper drops in, um, uh, uh, in employment during the summer months relative to women, unmarried women without kids. And so this phenomenon is occurring both among kind of unmarried women and married women. So um, I would say, you know, it is smaller among unmarried women than it is among um, married women. So among married women um, with children, they experience the largest um, summer decline in employment. Um, but it does kind of, uh, I would say it's pervasive across um, demographic subgroups. Um, with regard to like whether these separations or outflows are voluntary or involuntary, I think that's really interesting. Um, so uh, I was trying to figure out if there was a way for us to get at that with um, uh, information provided in the CPS regarding, you know, like firing. I don't think that we've looked at, I would have to go back. I think at some point we tried to look at reasons for separation. Um, and, uh, you know, what I can say is that we do have reasons for non-participation. And so separation, so, uh, Unemployment, I think, is probably more indicative of um, uh, women being fired than uh, you know, actually transitioning from like employment to being out of the labor force, for example. And so we find that the kind of big differences um, between mothers and non-mothers in terms of um, the transitions during the summer is actually transitions into um, non-participation rather than transitions into employment. Uh, sorry, unemployment. And so uh, to me that, that it seems that it could be um, uh, more voluntary than involuntary in the sense that their employers aren't literally firing them, but it's not necessarily the case, you know, uh, what is voluntary and what's involuntary when, you know, you have to find someone to take care of your kids. It's actually, it's not entirely clear. And so um, I don't want to say that it's like totally voluntary, but I, I would say um, the evidence so far suggests that it's not necessarily employers firing women. Does that help? Yeah, thanks, okay. Melanie. Okay, great. Okay. So the last thing I want to document um, is that uh, alongside these uh, gender gaps in um, summer work along the extensive margin. There are going to be gender gaps in um, work along the intensive margin. So we're going to look at um, hours worked during the reference week. So individuals can either be employed and at work, in which case they are going to be working positive hours, employed but absent from work, in which case they'll be working zero hours, or non-employed, in which case they'll be working zero hours. At baseline, there are well-known large gender differences in hours worked per week. And so we're going to use logs for this specification in which we look at seasonality in aggregate hours. So what we observe is that women experience a substantial drop in aggregate hours worked during the summer months. This drop is um, about uh, 11, log, uh, 11 log points. And men experience a much more modest drop during the summer months. Um, I feel like I'm already going to run out of time, so I need to go through this decomposition a little bit quickly. But what we can do is we can see whether these drops in summer hours are due to changes on the extensive margin of work or changes on the intensive margin of work. And for women, both margins are going to contribute. Um, so the fact that women are transitioning out of employment and the fact that conditional on being employed, they're more likely to be absent from work or even conditional on contributing positive hours in the reference week, they're more likely to work fewer hours during the summer months. For men, the drop is entirely explained by changes on the intensive margin, especially transitions from being employed and at work to being employed and absent from work. And just so you know, you can look at why individuals are absent from work and during the summer months, um, it's basically like 99% vacation. And so, 
we can look at these changes in levels, we can look at these changes in percentage changes, and you reach a similar conclusion, the gender differences are more pronounced in percentage changes because the baseline gender differences, um, baseline uh, hours worked for women are lower than for men. Um, so here we see that uh, women's changes in employment, both on the extensive and in intensive margin, are contributing to their substantial drop in hours worked over the summer months. So just to recap, we've documented that prime age women disproportionately experience employment declines, labor force exits, and reduce their hours during the summer months. Over the summer months, men experience if anything an uptick in their employment population rate. They also experience a drop in hours worked, but it's a much more modest drop than that of women. So in the next part of the presentation, what I wanna do is I wanna to turn to the central role of school closures in generating these gender gaps and summer work interruptions. So annual school closures are likely to disproportionately affect women. And And we start off by acknowledging that school closures uh, disrupt school provided implicit childcare. And there are various, I would say, predictions that kind of result from the notion that school closures approximately disrupt childcare. The first thing that we wanna do is a bit of a uh, kind of a sanity check to ensure that school closures are indeed kind of the root of these summer employment declines. And the first thing that we do is we um, exploit the fact that there is geographic heterogeneity in when schools get out throughout the US. And we find that the female drop in summer work aligns very tightly with their local school schedules. So this to us suggests that school closures are indeed the root of these summer work declines. Then what we do is we look at groups of women that would be particularly affected by disruptions to childcare due to school closures over the summer months. And so what we see is that uh, when we look at the heterogeneity in the summer work declines among various groups of women, we see that the drop is concentrated among mothers, particularly mothers of school-age children. These mothers report that the reason for being out of the labor force is taking care of their family, taking care of their children. In addition, we see that there is an uptick in their total time spent on childcare over the summer months. The last thing that we do is we look at to what extent sectoral and occupational sorting contributes to the gender gap in summer work interruptions. So school closures imply a disruption to school provided implicit childcare. School closures um, are also tightly related to the fact that the education sector contracts during the summer months. Women are more likely to work in the education sector. It's not clear if this is a feature or a kind of bug in our interpretation. So it's probably no coincidence that women are disproportionately likely to work in a sector that affords summer flexibility. But we wanna make sure that the education sector isn't, I would say, mechanically accounting for the gender gap in summer work interruptions. And so what we do is we kind of decompose the gender gap and the change in the, in the employment population rate throughout the summer. And we find that women do indeed sort into sectors and jobs with summer flexibility. This explains about half of that gender gap, but there's a strong within sector and within job component that remains. And so um, with this kind of constellation of facts, we think that school closures are the kind of unifying explanation um, behind them. So first I'll show you the geographic heterogeneity in school closures and how this aligns with female employment declines during the summer months. So what we do is we exploit the fact that there are earlier summer breaks in much of the country and later summer breaks in the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest. So we use a data-driven proxy for the timing of school closures. So in the CPS, they survey 16-year-olds and ask whether they are currently in school, so currently attending school. So we observe whether they are currently in high school. And then we compute the share of the May to July drop in 16-year-old high school enrollment that occurs by June. And so a state is designated as an early closure state if the majority of that drop occurs by June and a late closure state if it does not occur by June. So this gives you a sense of kind of the distribution. And so we have our early closure states over here in blue. We have our late closure states over here in orange. Okay, so, and then we have some states in the middle that are a bit mixed and we actually omit these from our analysis. 
So just to validate our measure, we find that high school enrollment, so relative to May, high school enrollment in the early closure states drops early, in the late closure states drops late, okay? That's these blue and orange respectively. And then more interestingly, what we find is that female employment tightly tracks school closures in their respective state. And so in the early closure states, female employment drops starting in June. In the late closure states, female employment does not budge until July. And so this to us is, I would say, pretty compelling evidence that these female employment declines during the summer months are tightly linked to school closures in their locality. So the next thing that we want to do is look at kind of the ramifications of school closures and the contraction of implicitly provided child care for um, various groups of women. So if indeed schools are, um, if indeed these childcare uh, contractions are um, constraining women's labor force activity, we would expect that certain groups of women, such as mothers of school age children, would be particularly affected. And that is exactly what we find. So here, um, as I was uh, telling Mike earlier, we look by marital status as well as by parental status. And we find that within unmarried women and within married women, the presence of a child, your own child in the household, um, substantially uh, amplifies the summer decline in female employment. Okay. We can look further at the age of the child. And what we find is that the drop is most pronounced among mothers of young school age children, that is children ages six to 12. And so these are children who are attending school during the usual school year and are too young to be left unattended while not in school. In contrast, the, uh, I would say summer decline among other subgroups of women is virtually indistinguishable from one another. So it's really kind of this one subgroup of women um, uh, with uh, children ages six to 12, um, among whom the, the, uh, the drop is most pronounced. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, we can, using information on, uh, in the CPS as to why individuals are not in the labor force, we can look at how individuals account for their non-labor force participation. From May to July, there is an uptick in women, especially mothers whose youngest ch uh, child is between the ages of six and 12, saying that they are not in the labor force because they're taking care of house and family. Um, in contrast, women without children, um, first of all, their labor force participation rate barely budges over this time period. And also there's only a slight uptick in their propensity to say conditional on not being in the labor force that it's due to um, taking care of house and family. Finally, we can look at the American Time Use Survey and we can, um, which is an entirely different data set, but its sampling frame is the CPS. We can stack data from 2004 to 2019, focus on parents um, whose youngest child is between the ages of six and 12 and examine their time use over the seasonal cycle. So we're going to be using both narrow and broad measures of childcare time. So there's primary time. So this is the, um, uh, how you spend your time in your kind of primary activity, your main activity during a particular um, hour slot. And this will be the sum of basic educational, recreational, and travel time. These are categories that um, are defined um, by Gurian, and Hurst, and Kearney in their 2008 paper. And then there's secondary time use. And these are activities that you do alongside your primary activities. And then we'll subdivide secondary time, uh, time use into um, the primary activities that they accompany. And so this will be um, household activities, things like cleaning your household, um, vacuuming, leisure, things like you know, watching television, um, and um, a kind of a catch-all other category. And we'll estimate a specification, kind of our seasonal specification at the individual level with day of the week fixed effects, which is standard in the time use literature. So um, I think one thing that was a bit surprising for us um, was that when we looked just at primary childcare time, so when your primary activity is childcare, there's actually a drop for both mothers and fathers during the summer months relative to May. And when we explored this drop, we found that this was um, due to the fact that both mothers and fathers are less likely to engage in like educational activities with their children, for instance, helping them with their homework in the summer months relative to the school year. Okay. What's interesting, however, is when we move to total childcare time, including both primary and secondary, we see an increase among both mothers okay, and fathers, like a deeper increase photo? among mothers. Oh, sorry, was there a question? 
took a picture of like no i didn't take a picture. i think i just need to mute i'll, I'll catch up um so we see that there's an increase among both mothers and fathers um, in total time spent on child care okay the increase is larger among mothers than it is among fathers and for fathers the increase and child care time, total time spent on child care is primarily child care um, as a secondary activity alongside leisure time. So alongside, um, you know, things like uh, uh, recreational activities or, um, you know, watching movies, watching TV. Okay. So the last thing that we want to do in order to um, examine the central role of school closures is acknowledge the fact that education employment plummets over the summer. So, you know, when I was saying that school closures um, have, you know, ramifications for female labor force activity, we have to acknowledge that um, at the same time that schools are closing, the education sector is contracting in its employment. Women are disproportionately represented in the education sector. So part of the decline in female employment during the summer months is going to be attributed to the fact that women are more likely to work in education and education sheds workers during the summer. We would like to further examine, I would say in a formal decomposition, how sectoral and occupational sorting contribute to the gender gap in summer work interruptions. So, What we do is we decompose the gender gap and the change in the employment to population week, uh, employment to population rate during the summer months. And we use standard Oaxaca blinder decomposition techniques um, in order to decompose this gender gap into a between component. So a between sector, between occupation component, the fact that there are gender differences and the propensity to sort into different sectors and different occupations with different propensities to afford summer flexibility, with propensities to um, have, with different propensities to generate summer outflows, and a within component that we, even within a given sector, within a given occupation in a sector, there could still be gender differences in the propensity to exit employment during the summer months. So just to go a little bit deeper on what we're going to do. So there's going to be a bit between sector component. So between sector effect, this is the fact that women are more likely to work in the education sector. Education sector contracts a lot during the summer months. And then also there's a possibility that outside of the education sector, other female dominated sectors can experience relative contractions during the summer months. There will be a within education sector between occupation effect. So this could be something like women are more likely to work jobs within the education sector that experience a summer decline in employment. For instance, women could be more likely to work as primary school teachers. Primary school teachers are more likely to experience um, uh, a summer decline in employment relative to something like secondary school teachers. And finally, there's going to be a within occupation effect. So within jobs, women could be more likely to experience these net outflows during the summer months. So how we operationalize this, so for the between sector effect, we define 14 sectors, so the education sector plus 13 other sectors based on IPM's industry, so kind of like one digit IPM's industries. Within the education sector, we define five broad occupational categories to capture the within ed sector between occupation effect. So here are the five categories. So roughly primary school teachers, secondary school teachers, post-secondary school teachers, other staff at uh, primary and secondary schools and other staff in ed services. And then with, there's also within occupation effect, which is a little bit of a abusive language, but within these ed occupations, we can see whether there are still gender differences in the propensity to exit employment during the summer months. And then within non-ed sector, either uh, the sector as a whole or occupations within the non-ed sector, there's still a residual gender difference in the propensity to exit during the summer months. So um, here's what we come up with when uh, we, uh, we do this decomposition and I'll walk you through kind of how to um, uh, understand this figure, how to read this figure. So kind of the punchline of this figure is that summer declines arise, summer decline, or I would say the gender gap in the summer decline in employment arises both within and between jobs. So here we have in black, 
the um, gender gap in the employment to population rate relative to May, okay? And then we decompose this into these various components that I mentioned on the previous slides. So first, there is the blue component, which is the fact that women are more likely to work in the education sector than men, okay? And the education sector contracts during the summer months, okay? So generates these net outflows during the summer months, okay? And so we see that this explains, I would say, quite a lot of the gender gap in the change in employment during the summer months. Next, there's orange, which is the fact that there's other sectoral sorting, so gender differences in the propensity to work in other sectors, okay? And these other sectors have differing propensities to um, uh, generate net outflows during the summer months. So there is other sectoral sorting that is also contributing to the gender gap and the change in the employment to population rate during the summer months, okay? Then there's the green component, which is within the education sector, women are slightly more likely to work in jobs such as primary school teachers that are more likely to experience summer declines in employment. Okay, so there's additional sorting of men and women within the education sector that's contributing to this gender gap. Okay, then there's purple, which is the fact that even within ed sector occupation, so even within primary school teachers, even within secondary school teachers, women still have greater net outflows during the summer months relative to men. And then finally, there's pink, which is the fact that in, within the uh, non-education sectors, there's also a substantial gender gap in net outflows during the summer. So what we take away from this decomposition is that sorting across jobs, so either cross sectors or across occupations within a sector explains about half of the gender gap in the change in the employment to population rate during the summer months. But a strong within sector and within job component remains. And um, in the interest of time, I won't click on these buttons, but what we can show you is that within granular occupations and educational services, so within primary school teachers, within principals, within janitors, women are still more likely to exit employment during the summer months relative to men. Among workers outside of educational services, women are also more likely to exit employment during the summer months than men. And these exits are aligned with the local timing of their school closures. And so we think that these childcare disruptions due to school closures are consistent with both the sorting effect, so the fact that women are more likely to work in sectors and occupations within sectors that afford some more flexibility, as well as the within gender differences that we detect. The fact that even within an occupation or within the non-education sector, these gender differences and net outflows still persist. So just quickly on other demographic heterogeneity. So we find that the summer decline in female employment is um, I would say most pronounced among women who are of an age where they tend to have children. So starting at ages 30 to 34, um, they're more pronounced among um, white individuals than among black individuals. And this could um, per perhaps be explained by socioeconomic differences among these subgroups as mentioned by Mike earlier. And then um, there's also some heterogeneity by um, educational attainment. So, you know, we actually can't reject zero for women who have um, less than a high school degree. Um, and they're, uh, they're most pronounced among women with, who are college graduates. Um, I can tell you that um, once we um, kind of control for the fact that college graduates are more likely to be teachers than other educational um, subcategories, um, this, I would say, aligns the, um, uh, the summer decline in um, employment much more so. So it can actually remove some of these um, differences by educational subgroups. For men, there's basically nothing going on. Um, so not much um, demographic heterogeneity. Um, and this is you know, uh, consistent with the notion that um, men are really not experiencing um, summer declines in employment, um, especially relative to women. Okay. And then finally, in the last minute, uh, I know we wanted to end five minutes early. So in the last minute, um, I just want to acknowledge uh, that we're really thinking about the implications of this phenomena for earnings. So summer work interruptions may reduce earnings through a number of channels. 
So fewer weeks or hours were uh, spent working per year, reduced productivity due to work stoppages, um, reduced human capital accumulation over the life course, um, and also um, perhaps through compensating differentials for the amenity of summer flexibility. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's hard for us to get at earnings effects directly because of these various channels through which summer work interruptions um, can potentially affect earnings. And so instead, what we do is we examine occupational sorting and earnings. And so we identify occupations that are prevalent both inside and outside of the education sector with the acknowledgement that the education sector affords more summer flexibility than the non-education sector due to these school closures. And then within each of these occupations, we see whether there is disproportionate sorting of women into the ed sector version of the occupation relative to the non-ed sector version of it. And then also we look within these occupations are, is there an earnings penalty associated with working in the ed sector versus the non-ed sector version where we use male earnings to abstract from kind of the direct effect of these um, summer work interruptions due to disproportionate childcare demands. And so here, um, what we see is that the female share of employment is systematically higher in the education sector version of an occupation relative to the non-education sector version of an occupation. You see this across nearly all of these occupations that are um, prevalent in both the education and the non-education sector. So this to us suggests that women are sorting, um, perhaps in part due to the greater flexibility, summer flexibility afforded by the education sector into the education sector version of these occupations. Certainly they're sorting for other reasons as well. And then last, oops, uh, last, I would like to show you that um, across, I would say, the vast majority of these um, occupations, there is an earnings penalty, so a male earnings penalty associated with working in the ed sector version of the occupation uh, in comparison to the non-ed sector version of the occupation. And um, to us, this suggests that there could be kind of a compensating differentials story at play where women could be sorting into the ed sector version of the occupation um, and kind of trading off um, some earnings, including, so I can tell you that a large portion of this earnings penalty is an hourly earnings penalty. And so it's not just annual earnings. Um, and so trading off some earnings and compensation in order to gain access to greater flexibility. So just one minute conclusion. So in this paper, we show the summer declines in female labor force, uh, labor market activity. Um, uh, we show this in a number of dimensions. So there's a 1.1 percentage point decline in EPOP, 0.5 percentage point decline in the labor force participation rate, 11% decline in aggregate hours during the summer. Um, we establish a central role of school closures. So these summer declines closely track school calendars. They're concentrated among the subgroups of women that you think would be most affected by childcare disruptions due to school closures, namely mothers of school-aged children. And we find that sectoral and occupational sorting explains, I would say, part of this gender gap. Um, but within jobs, there's still a, a substantial gender gap in summer outflows. Um, we see school closures as a unifying explanation for all of these patterns. Um, and then finally, with regard to um, earnings, um, we, uh, I would say, have some uh, suggestive evidence that women could be kind of sorting into um, sectors or occupations that afford more summer flexibility, um, and perhaps they are kind of trading off some compensation um, in order to gain access to that flexibility. Um, so thanks very much. I think I'm a little bit over, um, but I really uh, appreciate um, the engagement and this wonderful talk. Well, thank you so much. That was a really fantastic a really clear presentation that I think gives us a lot of food for thought. So do we have any more questions for uh, Melanie? Um, I've got a question. It's, it's not terribly well formed, so apologies for that. Um, but this is actually something that I looked at earlier on, um, but there's one age group that has for women that has an increase in labor force participation over the summer, and that's women who are more likely to be in school. So the youngest age group, the 18 to 24. Um, and there's an interesting pattern there too, which is in the, it's sort of the reverse of what you were talking about. So over the summer, there's a increase in the labor force participation of those women, but there's also an increase in 
women who are reporting that they're at home with families or taking care of families. And I don't think there's a similar pattern for men. Um, so I know this is that would be a different mechanism from what you're talking about, but it does seem to sort of fit in with the story of a uh, uh, ability to say invest in human capital, whether that's like an internship that certain people are taking, um, but that they're not able to take because they have responsibilities at home or something like that. And I wondered if you could comment on that at all. Yeah, so just one clear, um, uh, are you saying that among younger women, so in like the 18 to 24 age range, there's an uptick over the summer months in their propensity to work, but then also an uptick in their propensity to say that they are staying at home to care for children. And whereas for men, there's only an uptick in their propensity to work, there isn't an uptick in their propensity to say that they're staying at home. Yeah, I, yes. think, so I think that that's really interesting. Um, you know, uh, we haven't done any analysis of that age group just because we were, you know, worried about um, conflating, um, uh, I would say, uh, well, we wanted to work on prime age uh, working individuals, but then we were also worried about kind of conflating like schooling decisions with work decisions. So we wanted to go kind of post college, but um, I, yeah, I think that that, uh, that does fit in very nicely with this story. It is in, like, in fact, another mechanism. So even, um, you know, for early human capital accumulation, so like pre labor market entry, we might see that during the summer months, um, women could be, you know, less likely to um, take on internships, go to summer school um, because of these um, home responsibilities, as you mentioned. Um, so that's really interesting. Thank you for letting me know. Is there anything else? Okay, well, if we don't have any uh, further comments, we can uh, wrap up the audience presentation here and we'll transition to our conversation with our uh, pre-doc and postdoc trainees and postdoc affiliates. So um, I'd like to thank you again for a really fantastic presentation. I know that at least for me, you answered every question I had along the way. It was a really thorough and elegant presentation. So thank you very much for joining us. Great, thanks so much. So should I just stay on? Yeah, if you'll stay okay. on, well, uh, we usually have, um, well, we'll see how many students, uh, how many people we have stay on. We usually have about eight or so students um, from economics, sociology, and public health joining us. We all, as you know, we also have postdocs from a variety of disciplines. Um, and we just sort of use, like to use this time for people to get, hear a little bit about your professional development and, you, you know, maybe take questions about the job market and so on. So, um, and I'm happy to turn it over to you if you'd like to just ask people to you know maybe say a bit about themselves and their backgrounds and then take their questions if that's a, does that format work for you uh yeah absolutely so mm -hmm. yeah i would love um maybe to go around and just do a quick um round of introductions and then um yeah this time is yours so you can use it however you like okay do you want to do you want to call out names from your zoom box or i can yeah. Uh, oh, sure. Um, so why don't we start with Erica? Hi, Melanie. I'm Erica. I'm a first year um, PSC trainee in the Department of Sociology, uh, and I'm currently thinking about studying residential segregation um, in a population's lens, as well as um, studying like the, re like the segregation of public spaces. Um, still very much early, but uh, really great to uh, hear your presentation and all of the specific methods and all of that. Um, for my own understanding of how this research can be conducted. So thank you. Okay, great, welcome. Um, oh, sorry, uh, Emily, would you like to go? Hi, Melanie, great, great presentation, very thorough. I learned a lot. Um, I'm a, uh, recently started my postdoc uh, with, at the POP Center. Um, I did my degree at Cornell in policy analysis and management. Um, so I'm a sociologist demographer by training. Um, if you can take other people's questions and then circle back, but it would be great to hear about your experience um, transitioning from postdoc to assistant professor, um, especially coming from Michigan to um, uh, like an interdisciplinary, two different interdisciplinary spaces that you're in and how you've navigated that. Um, Michael, would you like to go? 
Um, I'm Michael. I'm, I'm an economics graduate student here. Um, I'm in my sixth year trying to wrap up, uh, although not on the market this year. And um, this is my third year as a, as a um, trainee. Um, and so I've, uh, I do work with education and also um, some in the health sphere, um, uh, looking at questions of mortality. Uh, so I'd be interested in hearing about your, um, that obviously is something that can fit into interdisciplinary practices as well. So um, I would be interested in hearing your perspective as an economist um, who works in um, both those education and, and with heavy overlap with other disciplines as well. Uh, Jane, would you like to go? Hi, um, my name is Jane. I'm a fourth year in the sociology and public policy PhD program um, here, and my interests are broadly around education and inequality. Okay, great. Uh, Sarah? Um, hi, I'm Sarah, and I have a cold. <laughs> I can't hear it. Um, uh, I'm a demographer and sociologist. I'm a PSC postdoc affiliate and a research investigator at the SRC. Um, I generally study families and caregiving for uh, older adults. Okay, great. And then uh, Jake. Hi, uh, my name's Jake. Uh, I am a postdoc at the Survey Research Center working with uh, Paula and I'm an affiliate of the POP Study Center. Um, I got my PhD in sociology from Ohio State and my research is broadly on uh, family demography and social inequality. Great. Uh, and then uh, Z, are you there? Maybe not. I don't think Hoyt is there either. Um, <laughs> no. uh, okay, awesome. Um, thanks so much for those inter introductions. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy um, to chat about whatever is of interest to you all. Um, you know, there were some questions about the transition from um, being a postdoc to being an assistant prof and generally working in kind of an interdisciplinary environment. And um, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, in general, um, so I think that there are different types of interdisciplinary environments. And so I can tell you a bit more about um, the, you know, the types that I've worked in. Um, so the Population Studies Center, it, you know, it, it is an interdisciplinary environment to the extent that you, um, you know, have these like joint brown bags, you have the potential to, you know, chat with individuals <laughs> from um, other disciplines. Um, and then you can, um, you know, ultimately, uh, I would say, I think it's up to you your own discretion, how much you import um, the kind of interdisciplinary like nature into your own research. And I feel the same way about um, my current position. So um, I'm in a group of economists um, at the business school. And so the business school generally is interdisciplinary. So there are economists, um, there are finance folks who um, what they say think very similarly to economists. Um, there are social psychologists marketing, organizational behavior. And um, I think what is great about, um, uh, you know, being in such an environment is especially for the types of questions that I ask is, um, uh, I find that in many disciplines, like especially social psychology, um, there's overlap in the in the questions that we ask. Um, and then we just approach it from kind of different angles, we have different models, different empirical tools that we use. And so I've really relished um, uh, chatting with my colleagues from other disciplines to hear like what is going on in their discipline with the, with the topics that I'm interested in. And um, with the goal of trying to like remove serious blind spots, which I think economists often have. Um, we think that we're like the first to tackle a particular question, but as it turns out, social psychologists, sociologists have like done this for 30 years. Um, and so, um, and, and it's also just really interesting. Um, and so I, um, I have thought that it's been a lot of fun. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I don't feel pressure to, um, I would say directly collaborate with, um, with faculty from other disciplines. I think that that can um, 
be incredibly beneficial, beneficial, but also um, uh, be challenging in terms of um, like your publication strategy, in terms of the methods that you use. And so um, it's kind of the best of both worlds, in my opinion, where I have access to these experts um, and can talk to them about um, my research interests here, what they're working on, really see what's going on, the topics of interest in other disciplines. But I don't um, necessarily need to kind of uh, formally alter my, my research trajectory. Um, so I don't know if that, that helps, but that's the way that I kind of think about um, uh, navigating the interdisciplinary nature. I mean, there's like a whole other discussion about like assessment um, in an interdisciplinary environment, which I think it poses its own challenges. So, you know, if you are in like a sociology department or an econ department, everyone is like speaking the same language. You have the same understanding of which publications are like top notch in an interdisciplinary environment. Um, there uh, is a lot of like communication that's necessary, I think, in order to uh, like facilitate understanding of the norms and standards of a specific discipline. But I'm not sure that that's what you were thinking about. Um, it's something that's like, uh, that I have only been exposed to, I, I would say, as I've kind of progressed as an assistant professor. Ellen, I was actually thinking about that as you were describing your interdisciplinary environment and wondering what advice you might have for people on the job market if they're considering going into these interdisciplinary spaces, what might you ask in the course of job seeking to kind of get a handle around how that assessment is done so that you at least have some oh, sense man. of coming oh, in? That's such a good question. I don't know. I'm actually trying to think if like uh, it would even be um, appropriate at the like job application phase to ask such questions. Um, I certainly did not think to ask um, such questions um, when I was on the job market. And I imagine that it is department and school specific. So, you know, for example, the public policy school here at UCLA is also multidisciplinary, but my understanding is that they have departments within the school in which um, assessment occurs, whereas the business school here is one department. And so one kind of multidisciplinary department. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, I would say there's probably quite a lot of heterogeneity. I think the one thing um, that is uh, that sometimes comes up on, um, at least in my experience on the job market, is um, you know some um, interdisciplinary um, schools and departments actually want to know whether this is something that you value. And so you know I was asked on the job market um, by at least a few places that were um, interdisciplinary. Um, whether I had thought about, you know, what it would be like to work in such an environment, um, would I like it? And so it is, you know, it's a good idea to think about that ahead of time and to, you know, have an answer ready. And, you know, hopefully the answer isn't that you don't want to work in an interdisciplinary environment, you know, it should be an answer like in the affirmative, um, but um, to kind of just re reflect on, on that. Um, and uh, I mean, I think one question that you could ask, which is a little bit more indirect as to um, the nature of an interdisciplinary environment is, you know, whether there are joint seminars, whether, um, you know, faculty from various disciplines tend to collaborate with one another to get a sense of whether this is like an expectation, a norm, or whether, you know, when you arrive, you can, um, kind of decide for yourself how you want to kind of navigate um, the multidisciplinary environment. Um, Paula, I'd be curious to hear, I mean, you, you probably have so much more experience. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that as well. I never thought to ask about it ahead of time either, so. <laughs> but it was interesting that it did, it did come up, you know, a few business schools did, um, did highlight this and I was a bit blindsided by that question. It wasn't, you know, I had a lot of um, kind of prep materials associated with the job market, and that wasn't one of the um, questions on like the list of potential questions. And so I, um, I have to say, I did not have a ready response, but um, I think it is a, a good thing to think about, especially if you are applying to business schools, public policy schools, where you know where that multi, multiple disciplines are represented. And sometimes you do, you know, uh, I'm just thinking about some of my co-authors and their experiences. Um, sometimes you do have to um, 
uh, give a job talk in front of multiple disciplines? So that might be um, a good question to ask. So like my job talk was only in front of economists here at Anderson, but um, I know at um, some public policy schools, you know, both like the political scientists and the economists like come out for the job talks. And so that can also be something that would be, um, uh, you know, a little bit tricky to navigate. Um, and also it might, um, uh, it might prompt you to at least introduce your job talk a bit differently. You know, knowing that there isn't as much kind of common knowledge in the room, we could start a little bit more, you know, in like a higher level sense, um, introducing them to like the importance of this topic in your particular field. So you, I wouldn't change the entire job talk, but I might um, provide a little bit more kind of like background information if I knew that it was going to be kind of multidisciplinary. And then any other questions? Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what your job search was like and how, you yes. know, how whether you were imagining going to a business school is sort of one among many options or whether it was a top priority for you. Yeah, so I, that's a great question. Yeah, so I, um, I applied broadly to academic jobs and to, to some non-academic jobs. And um, I mostly applied to econ departments. I applied to um, some business schools and public policy schools. Um, that I thought would be a good fit. And um, I, yeah, I was uh, really delighted to, to get this job. Um, I was by no means like angling for a business school. And um, so I, yeah, I applied to like over a hundred jobs. Um, and uh, yeah, so definitely, definitely a broad, a broad search. Um, and I think in terms of, um, you know, so I haven't had the opportunity to work in an econ department. I did my PhD in an econ department though, but in terms of like the differences between or my perceived differences of working in a business school versus an econ department, I think the main difference is teaching. Um, so at a business school, you teach um, MBAs uh, primarily. I mean, if, uh, so on occasion, you might have the opportunity to teach PhD students. You might also be asked to teach undergraduate business school students. Um, but uh, I think the bread and butter is really MBA teaching. Um, and um, in an econ department, it'll be kind of a more like traditional mix of um, like undergrad and graduate graduate level teaching. Um, I think aside from that, um, you know, I'm in a small group of economists at the business school and they are my kind of immediate community. So it's almost like a kind of a mini, mini like applied micro econ department here. Um, and um, uh, I think that that's actually quite nice to be part of a, a smaller community um, and then I, you know, have access to um, like all the economists elsewhere on campus, including in the econ department. Um, and so I, I think, you know, when I um, initially got this job, the thing that I was most nervous about was the MBA teaching. I didn't know if I would, I just didn't know how it would go. You know, <laughs> you hear a lot of talk about it. I didn't know how it would go. Um, and, you know, it's, it's proved to be fine. Um, but that was, uh, uh, I think that that's the main difference. And that is uh, the one thing that um, uh, I think you have to like be excited about. Like you can't, you know, it's, it's part of your job. Um, it's a, you know, it's a small, but like non-trivial part of your job. It's not like you're teaching every quarter, um, but I think that if um, you're, uh, I don't know, you like shudder at the notion of teaching MBAs and don't go to a business school because um, it will probably be part of your job, yeah. But the rest is like, you know, I don't feel like my research trajectory has changed at all due to being here. I think that my research is valued. Um, and um, like I mentioned before, there are the benefits of working in this multidisciplinary environment where um, my colleagues are social psychologists. They um, work on organizational behavior. There is so much overlap in the types of things that we're interested in. And so it's, it's actually quite nice to have folks like right down the hall um, from other disciplines who are interested in the same things. Maybe you could just say a little bit. So you had a one-year postdoc here. Did you have? Did you defer your current yeah, position? Exactly. To, and so, can you say a little bit about the decision to pursue the to pursue a one-year appointment in the postdoc and how you feel like that yeah. helped you before you yeah, your current position? Yeah. So, um, so I yeah I went on the job market in um, 2015, 2016, um, and I uh, received the UCLA offer and the um, 
uh, Michigan Pop Study Center postdoc at the same time. So I deferred the start date of this job offer to do a one year postdoc. Um, I think um, doing a postdoc, um, even with a you know, job offer lined up can be um, beneficial for a number of reasons. So it was one year off my tenure clock. Um, so I think that that's uh, very attractive to most individuals. Um, it's uh, an additional year um, without, uh, without teaching. So this is just kind of like generally why postdocs are, I would say, increasingly, um, increasingly common. Um, and so it's, and especially after the job market, it's like a very nice kind of like quiet time to regroup, submit some papers, plan your next steps in terms of your research agenda, generate some new ideas. And those are things that I was able to do during my year um, at Michigan. Um, Michigan in particular was attractive um, to me because of their very strong um, labor group. Um, in the econ department, I was also attracted to kind of the uh, multidisciplinary atmosphere at the Pop Study Center. Um, it was a great postdoc, uh, very few obligations and, you know, a lot of time to focus on my research and to be in an environment where I thought that um, my research would thrive. Um, and so um, uh, I think there, yeah, there are a lot of pros associated with doing a postdoc. I'll highlight, you know, like one con, which is if you're doing a postdoc in um, a place that is not where you did your PhD and not where you're eventually going to take a job, then it means moving twice. And, um, you know, uh, you can judge for yourself how costly moving is. It's costly. You know, it's costly to move institutions. It takes some time to um, uh, feel like you are, um, I would say, fully productive in a new place. And it's, you know, it's, it's not only like the physical act of like moving all of your stuff. It's also things like I don't know, like getting set up so you can print, like use the printer, like these little things, they sort of like add up. And, um, and so uh, I think uh, like best case scenario is you have a postdoc either in the city where you did your PhD or in the city where you're, you know, eventually going to start a job. But, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of like highlight that uh, there are some, some costs if, um, neither of those two conditions is satisfied. Um, and then you can judge for yourself, you know, how, how costly it is. Yeah. Well, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Okay, so we're a little bit over our time. So I guess we'll, I'll wrap up here. And thank you again for a great discussion as well as a really outstanding presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. If you guys um, have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me over email. I feel like you were a little hesitant to speak up over Zoom. It's tough on Zoom, but yeah, feel, definitely feel free to reach out. All right. Thanks very much. Paula, thanks so much for this invitation. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.